Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just lead off of what Dr. Miller just spoke about, um, and it's really injury to the cartilage in the shoulder joint. And Dr. Uh, Miller talked about doing a total joint replacement. That's replacing the ball with the ball and the socket with a new socket. And um, just to review some of the anatomy that Dr. Miller talked about, this um, diagram shows the shoulder joint. There's a ball, and this is just going back um, to very simple, ball and a socket. Okay, and so when we look at a total shoulder replacement, on the left here we're replacing the ball with a new ball and the socket with a new socket. When you look at a reverse, we're replacing the ball on the opposite side and the socket on the opposite side. And I'll tell you a little bit why, about a little bit later on why we do that and what, <coughs> uh, what the advantage of that is and in which patients we choose to do that. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the shoulder anatomy. Just review some of the things that Dr. Miller uh, discussed and emphasize the important components of the anatomy <coughs> that are important for a reverse. Uh, when we use it, how it works, and, and what can go wrong when there are complications. <coughs> So this is the shoulder joint itself. You can see the uh, ball right here. That's called the humeral head. And this is the socket called the glenoid. And I'm going to point, just highlight a couple of the other important components. So again, that's the ball and that's the socket. And the other thing we want to look at that's important for a, road, for a reverse total shoulder are what's called the tuberosities. And when we look at the rotator cuff tendons, the muscle becomes tendon and that attaches to bone. The tendons of the rotator cuff attach to these two parts of the bone, called the greater and lesser tuberosities. And those are very important for the functioning of the shoulder. And if they're not working, then a total shoulder replacement will not work. And so they're an important part that we look at to see if we can do a total shoulder replacement or another procedure, or do we have to do a reverse shoulder. So this is a diagram of the rotator cuff, and Dr. Miller showed this earlier. This is looking from the front. The rotator cuff is a group of four uh, muscles and their tendons in the shoulder. There's one in the front, there's one on top, and there are two in the back. So the subscapularis is the one on the, in the front. This is the supraspinatus in the, on the top, and two in the back are the infraspinatus and teres minor. And the important thing to see is right here in the front is that lesser tuberosity. So this tendon is attaching there. And on the top is called the greater tuberosity, and that's really where the others are attaching. Here's looking at the rotator cuff from the side view, and again, you can see those four tendons. What's the function of the rotator cuff? First is it helps with shoulder motion. It helps us raise our arm, bring it in, bring it out. The second is it stabilizes the shoulder joint. So the, shul the shoulder is another ball and socket joint. Um, but it's unlike the hip, the hip is a nice deep socket. The, rot the shoulder is a more shallow socket. So to make that uh, more stable and a deeper socket, there's soft tissue that helps to um, stabilize it, make it deeper, and um, the rotator cuff then functions to keep that ball centered on the socket. <coughs> the rotator cuff must be functioning, as I said earlier, in order to do a total shoulder replacement. So when do we do a reverse total sh shoulder? The first is when there's injury to either the humeral head or the glenoid, or both. And that can be from trauma, that can be from arthritis, and I'll go through that. The second is when there's, the rotator cuff is not functioning. And that can be when there's a tear to the rotator cuff. Or you can imagine the situation with a fracture where those tuberosities are broken off. The rotator cuff is no longer functioning because it's attached to bones that are just floating and not attached to anything else. So, the three categories are the most common um, indications for a reverse total shoulder. The first is when you have osteoarthritis, which is what Dr. Miller talked about. But when you have osteoarthritis in the case of a rotator cuff tear, a chronic rotator cuff tear, um, where the rotator cuff is not functioning, then you would have to do a reverse. The second is where you have arthritis that develops as a result of a chronic rotator cuff tear. Okay. <laughs> Um, if you can have osteoarthritis, that can have either more acute or chronic, but when you have a rotator cuff tear, over time you develop arthritis as a result of that. And the third is really when there's a proximal humerus fracture. That means a fracture of that ball, okay? And I'll show you pictures as we go through. So the first that we're going to talk about is osteoarthritis, or just arthritis in the shoulder in the presence of a rotator cuff tear. So as Dr. Miller talked about earlier, Arthritis can present with pain, patients will have stiffness in the shoulder, and they'll have weakness. And particularly with a rotator cuff tear, they'll have a lot of weakness in the shoulder. We can start with a lot of the conservative management options of resting, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, 
But again, for arthritis, they often are not as effective, especially in the advanced setting. So there are a lot of surgical options, uh, arthroscopy if it's an earlier phase, fixing that rotator cuff tear early, um, but not in the, site of, in the presence of arthritis. So um, when you have uh, the arthritis, you have a cuff tear. Again, we can't do that total shoulder, so we're going to look at doing a reverse. Here's a patient with arthritis. It's sort of the general osteoarthritis. The joint space is gone, but their cuff does not function. So we're going to replace the ball here, the socket on this side, and you can see the range of motion that this patient has gained afterward, and that's an excellent result. The second category is when you, get, you develop arthritis as a result uh, of the rotator cuff, a chronic rotator cuff tear. So severe arthritis develops as a result of the rotator cuff tear. And what happens is that rotator cuff, which is supposed to center that ball in the socket, it's not functioning. So the ball starts to rise up. And then you develop abnormal wear of the bone of that ball and socket. And here's a picture of that. So this is regular arthritis. You can see where the bone um, of the ball and the socket are hitting each other. This is called cuff tear arthropathy, and that's where that ball is starting to go higher. So you can see on the left, they're still lined up pretty well. But on the right, the ball, there's the bottom of the ball and the bottom of the socket. They're no longer lined up, and that's a different problem than we saw earlier. The presentation can be pretty similar in terms of stiffness, weakness, pain. Um, patients often in that category have a history of a rotator cuff tear, but not always. We don't always know about that earlier on. So we can treat them with similar things in terms of resting, anti-inflammatory therapy. And then in surgery, we used to use more commonly the hemiarthroplasty. But as we have new developments with the reverse total shoulder, that's sort of a, uh, a more um, appropriate management. So here's a patient who had um, the same problem on both sides, okay? He had the cuff tear arthropathy, arthritis as a result of a chronic rotator cuff tear on both sides. On the right, he had what's called the hemiarthroplasty. We just replaced that ball. And on the left, excuse me, on, that was on the left. On the right, he has the reverse. And you can see the difference in the motion that he has as a result of that. The third category is the proximal humerus fracture, and this is where the rotator cuff doesn't function because the bones, those two pieces where they attach, are no longer attached. So these are the tuberosities, and those can break off, and here's a picture of that here. So now the rotator cuff is attached to, to fragments that are kind of floating there. So how do we treat a proximal humerus fracture? Well, if you think all of the pieces are going to heal, including the ball and those tuberosities, you can fix it with a plate and screws. If you think the tuberosities may heal, but the ball will not, then you take the ball out, replace it, and you reattach the tuberosities right here. And now the rotator cuff is still functioning because it heals back down. If you think that the ball will not heal and the tuberosities will not heal, well now you have a joint surface that's broken and you have a rotator cuff that's not functioning, mm -hmm. so you do a reverse. How does the reverse work? Why do we do it? What are the mechanics that make that different than a total shoulder replacement? Um, it basically alters the mechanics of the shoulder and it lowers, this is the center um, uh, of a regular shoulder. When you do a reverse, you're basically lowering that center of rotation and you're moving it further to the inside. What that does is that alters the mechanics and it allows your deltoid muscle, the big muscle on the side of your arm, to take over. And so that deltoid muscle is now functioning and must be functioning in order to do a reverse. But that's why it works. One of the problems with the reverse, however, is it does have higher complications than a total. You can have fractures associated with it. You can have loosening of the implants. Um, they can loosen from the bone and from each other. You can have infection. You can have instability, and you can have some of the screws. Um, let's see if I have a picture. The screws uh, right up here that help hold that sock in place can break. So in conclusions, the rotator cuff are four tendons in the shoulder. They help to keep the humeral head or the ball centered on the socket. Uh, when there's injury to the humeral head or the glenoid and a rotator cuff that's not functioning for a variety of reasons, um, that's when we would use a reverse total shoulder. They do have a higher risk of complications, but they have very good functional outcomes. So, thank you.